we had said we'd probably rec start recording sessions once we start the presentation. We wouldn't record you know, beforehand when everybody's chatting. So thanks for the reminder. Um, so let me go ahead and, and do this and share. Let me know if you all can see it. Getting you, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then I'm just going to uh, play the slideshow. Everybody can still see that. So um, you can see I will admit up front that I have stolen shamelessly from the internet as far as flower images and <laughs> information. But I also will have um, in my notes and everything for tonight, I'll have a handout. So um, if you'd like, um, just in the chat, let me know if you'd like the handout with the notes and I'll have all the references of the different websites that I've used to gather the information too. So you can see in this picture, just um, a poinsettia on the left and then various varieties of amaryllis on the right that we have here. So let me go ahead and start with poinsettias. So um, as a lot of you have probably seen, and please jump in with questions or comments and your own, own feedback, so this is really um, interactive, is that there are so many varieties. So, you know, there are up to what are considered over a hundred varieties now of poinsettia. And I think if, if like you, every time I go to a nursery or wherever every year, it's like, oh, wow, more colors more varieties, everything like that, which I think makes it exciting to be able to go ahead and, and um, have new varieties to try out or, or grow or have adorn your home for the, the holidays. I give you a little bit of background from a botanical um, perspective. They're part of what's called the Euphorbiaceae or Spurge family. Um, and the plant botanically is known as Euphorbia pulcherima. So that's a formal botanical name. Um, one of the things, and I'm sure we've all noticed this, sometimes when you have green leaves that fall off, there's a milky sap. It's known for milky sap that um, comes out of that intersection between the leaves and the, and the stems. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever had a reaction to it, um, but in my research, I found some people who have like latex latex um, skin reactions may have a slight skin irritation reaction to the sap. Um, the, the sap can cause some nausea and diarrhea in pets. So you've probably heard, I know I've heard that it's poisonous to cats or, or animals. So basically, you know, it's recommended to stay away from, um, keep the plants away from animals or animals from, from eating them. Um, but the poinsettias themselves are not poisonous to people. I thought it was interesting. There was a, um, a study shown at Ohio State University that you'd actually have to eat like 500 leaves from a poinsettia to be poisonous, like a 50 pound child. So um, to humans themselves, it's not, they are not uh, poisonous. Now, um, just a show of hands, um, I know I didn't know this at first. I always think the bright showy parts, the pinks, the reds are the flowers, but um, they're actually considered what's called bracts, the bracts and that part of the plant. And the flowers are actually the little tiny yellow pieces in the middle of the plant. How many of everybody know, know that or just a little fun fact on, on that? So. Um, and the poinsettia actually originated from Mexico. So in 1828, it was brought to the United States by Joel Poinsett, and i.e. the name poinsettia was then go gone ahead and, and used in the U.S. for this plant. Um, he was actually the um, first ambassador to United States ambassador to Mexico. And also 70% um, of the um, poinsettias uh, grown in the U.S. and sold within the U.S. are through the Paul, Paul Eck Ranch in California. So um, I was reading that actually, I guess for the longest time, they had um, developed the um, technique of being able to pinch or prune the plants that would allow it to branch out and become fuller. So they almost, they pretty much had 
about a I just got to work on this after this meeting. I'm sorry. Oh, everybody good? Okay. So um, they, they pretty much had a monopoly and then that leaked out and somebody published it. And then now more nurseries across the, the country are growing, though the most are in California. Um, I didn't know, but actually Crow's Nest here in Blacksburg, um, Jay, the owner, they grow their poinsettias and in their greenhouse. So they're not buying them in as full plants like the big box stores. So just a, a thought, I don't know if anybody's ever gotten them there, but he has a wonderful variety. So that's my little plug for shop local, if you will, on small business. And then on December 12th is known as National Poinsettia Day. That was the day that actually the um, ambassador from Mexico, Joel uh, Poinsett, passed away. So that's how it's celebrated. And again, I have full notes list, but I put on here just the reference page for the information I've gotten on poinsettias came from the um, Illinois Extension Agency. So if you're ever looking for plan information in general, the, your extension agencies are a good resource for general plan information. Um, I thought since, I don't know if you're a plant and flower lover like me, it's always like eye candy is our plants to me. <laughs> so I uh, you know, pulled out some photos of different poinsettia varieties just for us to enjoy them as well. So, um, I don't know, I think I've seen the winter rose marble in stores before. I think that's a pretty popular variety. Um, and the, the ice punch, which seems to have more of the pointy leaves. I had never seen the autumn leaves um, variety. I think that's really striking to me. It's almost would make a great like Thanksgiving plant if, if they had them around. So, and just to give you a little bit more of, um, some some history or facts as we as we look at some of the um, varieties as well. Um, the Aztecs used poinsettia bracts to make a reddish purple dye for fabrics, and used this sap medicinally to control fever. So even there, um, there's a medicinal component that was uh, used for it. Um, poinsettias contribute over $250 million to the US economy at the retail level. Um, I mentioned uh, California is the top um, poinsettia producing state and poinsettias are the best selling potted plant in the United States and Canada. So that's pretty amazing giving all the different potted plants that are out there. So um, here are a couple more varieties. I like, I always, I like leaves that are variegated and where you have the different colors and patterns. So, you know, I really like a sparking, sparkling punch. Um, but the, you know, for winter, you figure even after Christmas, you know, variety like polar bear would be nice to use even through kind of a winter, as a winter color with some other, other colors as well. So that just gives you an idea of a few out of the hundreds of varieties that there are. Now to kind of get into more of what I wanted to focus on, and that's about um, caring for the poinsettia, both holiday care as well as aftercare. Um, so what we want to, do, what you want to do is, and you probably already know this, if you've if you've had poinsettias and cared for them, they don't like drafts, um, they don't like the cold. So even if you get a poinsettia. Um, at a store somewhere, most of the time they'll wrap it for you because even a little bit of cold weather can, um, they're not happy. You know, they can drop leaves and, and not do well. So you want to get them from the store into your house in a warm, sunny window and um, at least six hours of bright indirect sunlight every day. Um, daytime temps between 60 and 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, night temps around 55. Um, there, you'll read some, some differing night temp uh, suggestions. Um, this one again came from the extension. They said even, they suggest if you can move your poinsettia 
to some place that's a little cooler around 55. But other you know, suggestions are 55 to 60. But basically, they like it a little cooler at night than they do during the daytime. Now, you want to water when the soil is dry and then allow it to drain. Um, I know it's kind of a pain. If you've run into this, you know, they put the nice foil bottoms and foil around the poinsettias to make it look really pretty around the pot. But the thing is, you have to be really careful because you want to puncture that foil and put holes in it. You really want to make sure there's drainage. Or if you want to keep the foil, then you, when you water it, take it out of the foil and let it drain very, very thoroughly. But I'd suggest is poke holes in the foil and then put a saucer underneath because the big thing is that the plant can get root rot and really die off. And I don't know how many of you have experienced that, but I know I, I have in the, in the past where it's just, yep, too much water. Um, at, at the flip side, and they can be a little sensitive is, you know, they really start to get ugly and, and can drop leaves when they get too dry too. So, you know, it is a water sensitive plant. So you have to um, be careful about the, that balance. But I think drainage, providing drainage holes, and that's really important for any plant um, to have the proper drainage so that water doesn't accumulate at the bottom and um, rot out the roots. Now, so that's your typical care, you know, when you have your points that is around for the holidays. And typically, you know, following those guidelines around temperature and, and um, moisture and things like that, you know, you've probably noticed they'll, they'll bloom for about, you know, six to eight weeks. So what you can do now blooming, remember, is, you know, those little yellow flowers, you know, within the, the middle. Now you can continue that post care to have after the holidays and continue with the leaves and you start post holiday, your normal watering until spring. So you keep it indoors, normal temperatures, sun, things like that. And then in spring, that's really around mid April or May, you wanna cut back the stems until to about four inches above soil. And then repot in a larger container, water thoroughly and place back in a sunny window. Because what you want to do, what you're doing is that growth when it's done and done growing to that point, you basically want to reset it for, for growing again and getting fuller growth and potential to go ahead and, and flower once again. Now, after you go ahead and cut back those stems and repot it, then you're going to want to look for new growth. So once new growth starts, that's when you can start to fertilize every two to four weeks. Because again, you want once that new growth is starting, that's when you can go ahead and give it some more nutrition to start again with the branches and, and the flowers and I mean the, the leaves, the bracts. Now in early summer, that's meaning when the night temperature is above 50 degrees, that's when you can move the plant outdoors in a pot. And then you, what you wanna do is put in a slight, slightly shady location and then gradually have it adjust to more sun. Because the thing is you don't wanna shock the plant initially. And so that's why you gradually have it adjust to the temperature and, and the light. Now this will, then you'll have your poinsettia growing. And what you wanna do is prune it during the summer. So it's early to mid July. Um, so what you wanna do is you know, prune it off about an inch on the end on each stem. And again, that stimulates just more growth and branching. And so that will help it get fuller and, and grow out as opposed to just keep it, to keep growing up. And then in September, um, you prune again around mid-September. And this is a little bit of more severe pruning. So that would be about two to three inches on each stem. You wanna leave, um, I apologize, I noticed a, a typo. You wanna leave, not lead, 
but leave three to four leaves per stem on there. Um, and then, so we're going into fall, that's when you do that second pruning. Your temperatures are gonna get, going to get lower again in nighttime evening temperatures. And so that's when you wanna bring it back inside. Remembering again, they're tropical, they're from, New, from Mexico. So they're very, very sensitive to the cold. And so you wanna bring it back inside near a sunny window. Uh, continue to water and, and fertilize um, throughout. And then what happens is, you know, it'll continue growing and you'll have the leaves and grow and everything like that. Um, now to bloom for Christmas, this is one of the, the flowers that needs to have kind of that dormancy stage where you go ahead for it to bloom. It needs that shorter day length. So from early October until Thanksgiving, find a closet, put a box over it, give it 12 to 14 hours of complete darkness. And then Thanksgiving, you can you stop the dark, the that dark period. And that's when you keep a plant in the sunny area at least six to um, six hours a day. And then you want to reduce the fertilizer. So that gives the opportunity not the fertilizer provides the nutrients for the plant to grow and the leaves, but you want to back off that to allow the chance for the poinsettia to rebloom. So with that, um, any questions about poinsettias? Um, has anybody had personal experience? Um, keeping them, doing something similar, doing something different with success. Um, yeah, because I want this to be a sharing too, as far as what other people have experienced in, in having poinsettias. Um, Phyllis? I can't see if um, <laughs> they are or not, but um, I have some poinsettias that are, are maybe five, six feet tall mm -hmm. and it, that I've had for years and years. And it's, I put them out on the back deck mm -hmm. and through the summer, which they love. And it seems like as soon as I move them inside, you're talking, you're talking about the darkness Mm -hmm. in the closet or box. Yeah. It seems like if you put your poinsettias outside and then move them into the house where, where you just get the, the sign through the windows, mm -hmm. the poinsettias think that they're in a closet. <laughs> because mine, I mean, I've tried, I covered them up with sheets Mm -hmm. and things like that to give them total dark. But if they've been outside in the bright summer light and you bring them in, um, they think they're in a closet and okay. then they start changing. It's really weird. Yeah, well, that's good. That's a good point because you might need, you don't, might need, might not need that stuff. You, like you're saying, you could almost skip that because they're sensing a change in the amount, the intensity of the light. Yeah. And that, that reminds me, I guess, you know, they grow them, can grow them year round, you know, like down in Mexico. Absolutely. And, yeah. yeah. And they get to be like 12 to 15 feet. Yes. Tall. Mm -hmm. Down there. Um, I, I do have a question though, um, and other people who have poinsettias, um, it seems like about, and I sent a, a chat, it seems like about in March, my points, and I, you know, I'm watering them and everything, and it seems like about in March, all of a sudden, the sticky bug, I never see any bugs, mm -hmm. but, and I spray them before I bring them in, but there is goo all over the furniture under the poinsettias and stuff. And I've read that I never see aphids or anything, but 
I've read that keeping them, that letting them go dry mm -hmm. makes bugs pop out of them. Um, it, I, do you know anything about that? I, I don't know anything about that specifically around poinsettias, but I do notice I have a, um, oh, it's a Mediterranean plant, a bay leaf, a, a, a bay leaf tree or a bay tree, right? For the, the, for the herb bay leaves. And so it needs a lot of moisture. And so even I'm trying to spray and humidity. So it needs, I'm spraying during the winter. If it gets too dry, yeah, I'll get, I think it's um, like um, either spider mites or another insect yeah. Yeah, with that sappiness. So ah, I, it's mm -hmm. awful. Yeah, it is. It is in that, that sticky part. So I think, again, it's a matter of the, um, what I try to do is just spritz, spritz around and then around the leaves and then keep the, the an even amount of moisture. Mm -hmm. The reason I brought that up is some people who may want to try poinsettias, if it starts getting the, the gooky stuff, they may just throw it out and right. You know, it's a shame because they really grow into trees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. So being um, kind of getting through that, I've tried, um, there are some natural insect um, sprays that you can use. Um, shoot, it's escaping my mind right now. What I use almost has like a heavy clove scent, that kind of thing. And sometimes- The neem oil? The neem oil, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So sometimes that can help reduce the, uh, the amount of bugs. And if anybody sees, I don't think I can see the chat with sharing my screen. So if there's something, a comment or something that comes up, if um, somebody doesn't mind chiming in and let me, letting me know what it is, we can talk about it too. So that's just the one thing I noticed. I don't think I can, I can do that with uh, the screen share, so. So that's a, that's a poinsettia care. Um, and, you know, of truth be told, I've not gotten it to rebloom, you know, actually with those yellow flowers. But I think after doing this and talking, I think it would be fun, um, you know, if any of you decide to, too, we can revisit this, uh, you know, next year <laughs> even and see, okay, have we tried this and uh, see if we've gotten them to, to rebloom. So that's a poinsettia care. Um, next, I wanted to go ahead and talk a little bit about amaryllis. So it seems like a, a number of us have grown them before. And, and the first time I, I uh, tried amaryllis, I was like, wow, this is great. You know, it's, it's a pretty easy plant bulb to grow when you think of it. You know, I've always gotten the, with the box and sometimes you have the pot and the soil to throw it in there, start watering it. So I think, getting something like that, starting it to live and grow and bloom the first season is pretty straightforward. I think, you know, you'll see there's a little bit more care involved in trying to get it to grow than through the summer and rebloom. But I think it's still um, very possible and, and doable. So how many of you here have done that? Um, re Repotted and regrown. I think I've been able to get it, get one done, rebloomed yeah. once. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's really rewarding because mm -hmm. I read. Also, you see here on my on my um my slide. You know they can live for seventy up to seventy five years. So you can keep going ahead um, and caring for them. Mm -hmm. Lisa, I yeah. mine mine regrew. Can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, okay. Mine regrew by accident. I didn't know it was doing it until I, I had it in my garage. Wow. And I turned around and there was a beautiful red bloom. I thought, Whoa. That's awesome. And benign neglect. There you <laughs> go. That's it. That's it. It's amazing what nature will do, you know, in this spite sense. of us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, just to give you a little bit, I think I always I always like to learn a little bit of history around plants sometimes or, or learn a little bit more about them. So actually there's a story, it's a Greek um, mythology story um, of Amaryllis. So there is a love struck maiden who longed for a handsome but cold hearted Altio. 
Um, so she was desperate to win his love. She pierced her heart with a golden arrow, then visited his cottage daily, shedding drops of blood along the way. On the 30th day, beautiful scarlet flowers bloomed along the path. Altia was enamored. Amaryllis's heart was healed and our favorite holiday bloom got its name. That gives you a little bit of history from Greek mythology about Amaryllis. Now that is until it was reclassified in the 1800s under the genus Hippiaestrum. Um, but we all go by the common name of, of Amaryllis and that means to sparkle in Greek. That's where the word comes from. Um, Believe it or not, we, the U.S. imports over 10 million bulbs a year, um, mainly coming from Holland and, and South Africa. I, I guess I'm not surprised at that number because I think every year I see more and more stores carrying it. So you can go into a Walmart now or Lowe's, wherever, and of course online, the Brex of the world and, and so forth. Um, they make a, a really nice um, either gift for yourself or, or gift for somebody else who I think isn't even a really big plant grower, if you know what I mean, because it really, with minimal care and average care, you, you've seen the blooms if you've had them, magnificent and really enjoyable. And they actually reproduce by growing daughter bulbs next to the mother bulb. So that's how they go ahead and reproduce and grow. But actually, it does take about, um, I think, four to three to five years for that daughter bulb to reach a marketable size. So it's kind of a long, long term process. And then most amaryllis, of course, are only hardy in, in zones nine to 11. So for us around here, and I'll talk about the aftercare, it will mean putting them outside during the summer and then bringing them back in after the cold weather. So again, some, um, some plant candy for us to consider and, and some varieties if you're looking for new options coming up uh, this fall. And um, I just love getting plant catalogs too. I don't know about you all or not. Yeah. My, my problem is I can never decide what I want to get too. <laughs> so, but you can see, you know, the varieties that are more pink in nature, the red and white, the, the all red, Monaco, um, white, I think th that all white too with the green inside is just so striking. Um, you have more of the, like, can I would call it candy cane stripe, but like fairy tale with the red and white and just that beautiful pink hue of the last one, the one below, and it's called summertime. Uh, some more that the um, one here, Oh, and I forgot to, uh, to name that one, but that's a very, very uh, common one, the, the red color, amaryllis. And then I saw an article, there's a website called Dave's Garden and has a lot of um, good resources. And he had an article, and this is actually a, a new variety of amaryllis called Cybister amaryllis. And you can see that the leaves are more, and petals actually are, are more of like a spidery kind of type kind of reminds me of lilies, all the different varieties. A lot of lilies have the, the broader leaves, but then you have the varieties that have more of the spider. There are some spider lilies like that. And then this pretty one uh, down below nymph with the, uh, with the orange uh, stripes in the, in the middle. So as far as um, holiday care is concerned and, and growing amaryllis, um, obviously, you know, your largest bulbs are going to give you the most flowers. Um, so if you're somewhere where you can select them, like in a, in a box somewhere and pick them out, obviously you want the bulbs to be firm and dry and not have any mold or decay or chunks out of them or anything like that. Um, again, when planting, you want to use containers with holes. Um, and that's what really burns me up sometimes. I don't know about anybody else when you get plants or whatever. So many containers don't have drainage holes in them. And so I really think that leads to not being able to do the most proper, you know, watering. But, um, you know, they'll, they also have kits where you can go ahead and they'll give you the pot. Typically, you, they don't need a lot of room. So they like to be a little root bound, um, Amaryllis. So 
Um, you just want a pot that's an inch wider than the widest pot, um, part of the bulb, about twice as, um, as deep. Fill the pot half full with your sterile new potting soil, and then you set the bulb on top of that soil so the roots rest on it. And then you want the bulb to sit up above the edge of the container. So you want that, that tip of the bulb, you know, showing above it. Keep adding more soil, top it down around it until about a third or a half of the bulb is still visible. So as you've probably planted yourself, this is where you have one where you still have part of that bulb up above the um, soil level. And then you wanna water it thoroughly and then just allow it to go ahead and, um, and, and drain. Put a saucer underneath and place it in a sunny window. And then you're, you're set to go ahead and, and have it start growing. Um, as far as the type of moisture it needs, you wanna water when the top two inches of soil are dry. So you wanna keep it watered. Um, you fertilize when you start to see new growth visible. And you can water fertilize every time you water, but what you wanna do, you don't wanna over fertilize. So use half strength of your typical um, house plant fertilizer every time, because when you figure there's a lot of growth in a short period of time, primaryless. I mean, I think it's pretty amazing. You see, you know, all of a sudden it starts growing and then the shoots, you know, is coming up and then all of a sudden the bloom. So, you know, fertilizing will certainly help that process along the way to give it the nutrition that it needs. Now, when the um, buds, flower buds begin to open, that's when you want to move it outside of, out of direct sunlight. So it's still like sun, but you just don't want that, that bloom um, being hit by the direct sunlight. So that's the care you give when you have the plant for during the season, you pot it to go ahead and, and have it bloom. Um, now, after it blooms, you wanna cut the flower off once the flower has faded. Um, because you don't want the flower to go to seed. So anytime, and this is true, like when you have plants, um, you know, other types of plants as, as well. If you let things go to seed, then your, the energy in the plant is being used for producing seeds. But what you want to do, it's, um, I would equate it, I don't know if any of you grow garlic or not, but um, some varieties of garlic have scapes, which is kind of a seed, a shoot where seeds, mm -hmm. you cut those off early because you want the energy to go back into the bulb in the ground to grow the bulb as big as possible. Well, in this case, you wanna cut the flower off once the flower's faded because you want the energy going back into the plant, into the bulb. Essentially at this point, post bloom, you're doing everything you can to put that energy into the bulb for next season for growing. But you wanna, re you wanna keep the flower stalk, okay, on until it turns yellow. Again, that's because that flower stalk is still providing nutrients to the bulb that it will store for the next bloom season. Um, so you wanna keep the plant healthy and growing, keep it watered. Um, and the leaves, again, you want the leaves stay, to stay on and the stalk because those leaves are gathering sunlight through photosynthesis to produce the energy for the bulb. Now, once it's all done blooming, just move it to the sunniest possible indoor location. So you want it to get a lot of sun, keep getting sun again, as much sun because that photosynthesis is creating the energy going into that, that bulb. Um, you'll keep getting leaves, again, no flowers, just the leaves. You just continue to water and fertilize it regularly with an all-purpose uh, plant fertilizer. Now, so you're doing that all through the, the winter post bloom. And then in the spring, after the danger of frost, which again, I said earlier with the point set is after, you know, nighttime temperatures are above, well, this is after danger of frost, I'm sorry, it's not as sensitive as, as point set is, but after danger of frost. And just keep in mind too, you wanna make sure that it's later in the spring 
we can get fooled sometimes if you've grown tomatoes too sometimes you're like oh i think frost is done and then we get hit with another another frost that, by surprise so you want to make sure that's all out of the way and your nighttime temperatures are warm enough but you know put your amaryllis outside in its pot uh, first in the shade so again you because it's been inside in a sunny location like phyllis mentioned before the plant is thinking it's in a protected, not so sunny area. So you don't wanna just throw it into full sun or it'll kind of go into shock. So you wanna gradually adjust it to more and more sun until it goes to a location with full sun, which is about six hours a day. And you know, if you have a, a deck with a really great sun like that, you can keep it in the pot and put it there. Um, I also know people that will just, even in their garden or whatever that gets that six hours per day, you don't need to remove it out of the pot, but what you could do is just dig a hole in your soil and put the pot in it. So that way you have it in there, it's getting the moisture it needs from the ground and it has the appropriate sunlight. And then you fertilize monthly. Again, you're continuing to provide it the nutrients to feed that bulb in the soil and then bring it back indoors before the first frost in the fall. Either dig it up out of the ground or just bring your pot in and uh, bring it in before it gets uh, that, that frost. Now, the thing is, once you bring it in, it doesn't need to go dormant to bloom, okay? Not like the poinsettia, so remember the poinsettia was to get it to bloom again, those little tiny yellow flowers, you need to put in the dark for 12 to 14 hours. If you were to just bring that amaryllis in um, from your porch and put it in the sunny location in your house, continue to water it, it would, event it would bloom probably sooner than later. And if you want your amaryllis to bloom during the Christmas holidays or right around there, you can control that by having it go dormant. So what you do, again, is put it in a cool, dry location, dark location, mm -hmm. with the temperatures of 50 to 60 degrees. Um, you know, don't water, let the leaves go brown, cut them off. So again, you're removing light, which removes the photosynthesis and that it, does, it signals the plant to stop growing essentially. The leaves go brown, you cut them off, you leave that pot in the dark eight to 12 weeks and you don't water it. So you're letting that whole plant go dormant. And then after that eight to 12 weeks, then you remove the potted bulb from the dark place into a sunny location and start to water and fertilize as from the beginning of when I talked about when you would first pot the bulb and start to grow it. And so the flowers develop um, four to six weeks from your dormant bulb. So, you know, if you're talking three months, um, September, October, December, then you're talking probably what later, like the third week in September, you want to go ahead and have the bulb go dormant and follow this process for having it ready to bloom around the Christmas holidays. Lisa. Yeah. Um, with my amaryllis bulbs, um, I have them outside and on the back screened in porch. Mm -hmm. But um, I hear again that dark location is so difficult. So mm -hmm. what I do is I just stop watering them. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I don't let them die, yeah. but I, I don't water them like I do all through the summer. And when you let them dry out some mm -hmm. and then move them inside when it starts getting cold, mm -hmm. then they start and water them again. It's like, oh, it's time to wake up. Mm -hmm. and, and then they start sprouting their leaves again and um, 
you know, I just have a real problem with this dark closet stuff. Right. Because not many people at home are able to do that. Yeah. And that's a good point. And it's good that, um, you know, that you have that experience of not needing to put them in the in the dark to rebloom. I guess the ones that I have, I have, I've had a you know, garage to go ahead and put them in where it's, you know, cooler and, and dark, but it's, you know, it's good to know as well that you don't need to do that, that you would back off on the watering and the fertilization and yeah, and then start that back up when you bring them back in. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, too, I think when you have them in that location, they're starting to sense that daylight decreasing right even when they're outside mm -hmm. and then you stop the watering or lessing a lot less of it that's triggering that right um, to go I, think, the door I think moving them from outside to inside yeah is mm -hmm. right and then you know from year to year they don't need repotting every year but, um, and Phyllis, I don't know how often you repot yours, but, um, you know, typically, you know, what I've researched is, you know, about every three to four years because they, they don't need a lot of space, but you don't want them to completely, completely become root bound. You know, they, they need to be able to, to grow a little bit more the, the roots and so forth to be repotted. So, um, well, I'm, I'm a really lazy, <laughs> gardener and what I've found and where I have all of my amaryllis I go to um, Dollar Tree and get those glass column things and put my bulbs in the glass columns there's no drainage or anything but um, I just put my amaryllis in the top and then I water it and you can see the water going down through the clear glass thing. You, they don't like their feet wet, but I've had my amaryllis in these things for um, five, six years and you don't need to repot them or anything. Oh, that's a great idea because yeah, you, you have all that soil underneath to kind of give the roots the chance to grow and expand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lisa. Yeah. Susie. Um, yeah. Uh, do you need a larger pot when you repot them or do you, do you use the same width? Yeah. You want to, to give them a little, little more space. I would say maybe around an inch. Yeah. Around. That's usually the rule. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then a few more inches below, you want to give them that room to expand. Because the bulb will be larger, if, particularly if it has a daughter, right? Right, right. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Now, what what you what I'd suggest, and I don't know, it doesn't sound if you're not repotting, Phyllis, if this happens, but if you have a, a daughter, I mean, I've had some that have that daughter and they'll have that mm -hmm. shoot that come up. Um, I think you could also try to separate them. Yes. And then, you know, pot the daughter. But, you know, like I mentioned, it may take a couple of years too. <laughs> to get, you to have to be very dedicated with the daughters and sons because when they're tiny, um, it takes a long time for them to grow. But uh, they grow huge leaves. You know, so they are they're very active, but um, it it takes a, a it takes a while for them to to bloom. So it you can leave the sons and daughters on the mothers um, if you repot them, um, and the mother will still bloom, and the babies will have their leaves if you if you wanted you know if you're that dedicated <laughs> and I like them I mean in growing them 
to rebloom the next year. You, I think I love the leaves even in the winter time. Mm -hmm. you, you get the green even without the bloom. So you have that. And of course the, the benefit of just um, the filtering, not that it's known as a plant that filters carbon dioxide and recycles um, or filters um, uh, things out of the air, but still. I think how Wait, uh, are, are they um, are they part of a, a, an orchid family or something like that because their roots are are so dense and yeah they 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 certainly look very similar to it and I didn't truth be told I don't know and that's a good good question I wouldn't be surprised I didn't, um, in researching, find where it says they are specifically part of that family, but. But aren't, aren't uh, orchids epiphytes? Grow, they grow without soil. And these guys That's need true. soil. That's true, yeah. I would think it'd be more like a right. lily right. family. Right. I don't know, I can look it up. <laughs> No, I, I'm getting ready. Yeah, I was I was going to too. But that's a that's a good point. Yeah, your orchids more are without without soil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And that's a whole different subject too, growing orchids. But <laughs> yes, boy, I, I know I was thrilled one time when I got one to rebloom, and that's it. But there are people that that grow tons mm. of them. They're beautiful. My my sister in law had up to five hundred of them as a hobby. Wow. Oh my goodness! <laughs> yeah, she had the tiniest ones and the most and the huge ones. I mean, they were fascinating. How many ways they come? Oh, they are. And I think they they actually grow on every continent other than Antarctica. <laughs> but you know, Lisa. Yeah. Something with folks in in this group. Um. A really cool thing to do is to take an amaryllis bulb and put it in like with the spider plant or with um, it, in the summer with portulaca hmm. or something. And yeah. then you have your, your spider plant or house plant and then the amaryllis leaves coming over and then it just kind of sprouts out from the top yeah. and it gives your house plants interest mm -hmm. that are you know kind of boring oh that that's a really good tip yeah because when you do when they say you do pots or things like that containers outside you want your your focal the, the the height something tall in the middle and then a spiller that comes down around the sides mm -hmm. and then something to fill in. So that's a really good suggestion. You can tell Phyllis is a master gardener as well and actually a lot more experience than me. So I'm glad you're on the call, so. No, no, I'm not, uh, your information is great but it's just, uh, you know, some, just some lazy stuff that I've done. No, no, it's all, it's, it's all good because there's, Kind of the how-tos but then a lot of tips we can all all share as far as our experience right what works because that's what it is too i think is just a lot of um some of it with growing plants like a, a lot of things is trial and error so right you, know, you experiment and try this or, or try that um, then, lisa i was yeah. just going to say it says it's a distant cousin are, are um, a distant relative to the lily, and that's all. Okay, all it right. Comes from South Africa, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that makes sense. And it's called all kinds of lily: belladonna lily, Jersey lily, <laughs> naked lady. <laughs> anyway, so that's what I found. Great. Thank you. Thanks for sure. checking that. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then the third plan. Um, I was I wanted to um, go over is the Christmas cactus. Oh. As we all know, they go by all different names: Thanksgiving cactus, Easter ca cactus. Um, there are also ways, actually different varieties. So they do the plants 
can have differences in terms of their leaf structure and, and so forth, depending on that variety. They're actually botanically um, under the category called Schlumberger Brigesiae. And I'm probably killing the botanical name. I know when we went through master yeah. class. Um, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, they, they always say that you should know and memorize the Latin names because that's universal, but I'm sorry, I did this three years ago <laughs> after 50 years old. I'm like, I cannot memorize Latin names. So, but I looked them up so, so you know. And the reason they do that, just a little fun fact is, plants go by so many different common names mm -hmm. that you have a Latin name. So that way you can make sure if you're all calling it by the Latin name, it's the same plant, but. Yes, um, all plants and tell you that. <laughs> yeah, yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, so Christmas cactus, if you, as you may um, experience in growing it, um, it, it will adapt to a low light you know, growing inside, but it really does bloom best. Uh, with brighter but not direct light. You know, you get in very direct sunlight, then there's a chance that the leaves will get burnt, that kind of thing, get scorched a little bit. Um, now during the active... And that, Lisa, I'm gonna interrupt you. I had a gorgeous Christmas cactus or Thanksgiving cactus and moved it outside when it was gonna rain at mm -hmm. night. Yeah and forgot about it. And the sun just bleached oh. the leaves and burned them. So be very careful with that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I agree. I think that's probably, I think when I've had Christmas cactus, I don't know cactus, um, how many have put them outside during the summer, but if I do. you do. Yeah, but very shaded, like not in, in the shade. Yes. Yeah. yeah. With bright light. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the same way with a lot of, you know, with houseplants. They love, they go crazy if you put them outside during the summer, but you just have to be really careful about avoiding direct sunlight. So during the active growth, which is summer and fall, that's when you want to um, frequently and thoroughly water them. Again, remember, they don't let, like wet legs, so you want proper drainage. Um, they like temperatures in the 60 to 70 degree range and average to high humidity. So, um, you know, in the winter time, we get some dry heat, um, you know, just like ferns that like a lot of um, humidity. You could put a tray with pebbles and fill that with water and put the, put the um, pot on top, so. I've, I've done that a couple of years with different plants and it, it can seem to help. Also, you can put them in your bathroom if you have a room. Yeah. Nice yep. humidity. <laughs> My orchids do beautifully there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then, then I take them out if somebody, if I'm having company and I put them, you know, in other places and then I retire them to the bathroom. Oh, I got teased because this past winter I put, I had a couple of the, um, not the Boston ferns, but the Queen Queen Anne ferns or whatever, they're, they're similar, um, in my bathtub <laughs> to go ahead and whoops, give them the moisture and the, and the, that they liked in the humidity. So um, for re, for reblooming, so um, about six to eight weeks before you want them to rebloom, and that's when you cut back again on the moisture, the light, and the temperature. Now, again, I'm going to say you want to put them in darkness or a darker area and with a lower nighttime uh, temperature, with a lower temperature. So again, they're sensing a change from brighter and warmer to less bright and cooler. So then they, they cut back the growth. Lisa? Yes. Mm -hmm. can, yeah, you see, can you see my one of my cactus that I left out in the sun? No, can't. I now we can. can a little bit. Now you can. Yeah. Mm hmm And it just bleached the leaves. Yeah. You yeah. can't really see that, but but I believe you. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's hard to tell, but yeah. I've done the same. Sorry. Yeah, 
I mean, it's, it looks like it's coming back. It looks like it's- Oh yes, it, it, it came back quickly, but it was very sad. Yes, I'm sure. Um, and now, um, you know, the cactus is really easy, easy to propagate. I don't know if any of you have tried to do that, mm -hmm. but basically, you know, you can cut that a short Y-shaped piece from your plant. And, and sometimes I find that they break easily too, the stem. Mm -hmm. So if that happens, you can go ahead and just go ahead and take that and stick it down into, uh, into, into some soil. Slightly sandy soil can be helpful to help with rooting. Um, it's just a little lighter and that can help kind of spur the growth. But I've also done it where I've just stuck it in that soil, even sometimes the same, same pot or another pot with soil and kind of water it, keep it in the sun and um, not direct sunlight, but in a sunny area. And um, yeah, it'll, it'll start growing. It'll also root in water. Mm -hmm. That's what I was gonna say. Yeah, yeah. I've done mm -hmm. many of them in water. Yep. Oh, Susie, you've got yours, yeah. Just about ready to bloom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very nice, yeah. And that's, that's I just brought it in. Okay, great, right. so you had it outside, yeah. Mm -hmm. It blooms even though I don't pay attention to it. <laughs> As I said, I believe in that benign neglect with my yep. plants. <laughs> Sometimes that's the best way. I know. I've I've let plants well, over, over have, watering kills them more than not. I, mean, it? I know. That's yeah. the problem. So. Mm -hmm. Agreed for sure. So, did anybody have um, any questions or comments? Of, did you uh, say you were going to give us the notes from mm -hmm. the PowerPoint? Okay, good. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. I want these directions. <laughs> yeah, definitely. If it's good, what I'll do is I'll send you the PowerPoint and the and the notes because then it has that has more detail and it includes the website and everything like that. So yep. Is this going to be recorded? It is recorded. It is right. recorded now. So yeah, I've enjoyed going back. Mm -hmm. Now and just I have a last um let me go ahead and show this. So I just had to end with a uh a little little quote um so flowers always make people better happier and more um hopeful hopeful thank you it's covering up my my screen and the, there's sunshine food and medicine for the soul amen yep i have a, I have a t-shirt that says well i'm going out to the garden to lose my mind and find my soul so <laughs> that's wonderful some of, you, some of you can relate baby um, oh yeah. To that. Lisa. So, Lisa. Yeah, Diane. Um, have you heard of putting tea leaves after you brew your tea, putting them in uh, plants to, as a fertilizer? I have. I've heard of 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 that in addition to um, uh, coffee grounds being. Yeah. Well, I don't for, drink coffee, but I'm mm -hmm. for roses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, but I thought coffee? that was a deterrent for the bugs. What's that? Coffee grounds? Yes, well, for slugs and things. Yeah. Right. Well, I've also put that in my in my soil just to uh -huh. help as well for okay. for the for the soil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And roses, I don't know if anybody here grows roses. I have not attempted to do that. That's been... Knockout roses, yes. <laughs> right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, so if anybody does grow roses, I would love if you want to share some hints, we could do a um, do a Zoom on, on that. And just some, mm -hmm. some feedback too, if you want in the uh, chat or send me an email, if you enjoyed um, this around plants and have any suggestions, for other times to meet and different subjects, you know, let let me know. Or if you, if you really enjoy growing a certain plant or type of plants, you know, it doesn't need to be anything formal like this. Too, the goal goal is hopefully we can just share common experiences and interest and in kind of what we do and practical hints and everything. 
also you can tune in. To, um, everybody knows to Han Garden. They have they mm -hmm. have yeah. ever so often the lectures. I think yeah. on Wednesdays. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're they're awesome. They they go ahead and uh, yeah, they have definitely awesome um, information. Well, I always feel like I can hear the plant screaming, especially the poinsettias, mm -hmm. when people just have them for the holidays and then throw them out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I drive around and get poinsettias out of trash cans and things like that. They don't all grow because people don't take care of them, but they're fantastic plants. Mm -hmm. No, you're right. It is kind of a shame that so many um, use them just as a um, kind of seasonal. And but, don't you, but don't you think that indoor plants are a little trickier than putting things in the garden and then leaving them to grow outside? Oh, yeah. Oh, I, I agree. Like versus having the perennials, which you can just plant. Right. Yeah, maybe why people throw them out because they don't have the wherewithal or interest to pursue that. Right. Yeah. You, yeah. you two are gardeners, so you're right. No, so you're you're right, but um, yeah. I just hate that people throw them away. <laughs> I, I always, when I taught young children, I always told them that we need plants more than plants need us because they don't need us for food. They can grow on their own and we need to build with them, to eat them, to put them on our bodies. And there's all sorts of things we need um, plants for. So. Mm -hmm. No, that, that, that's true. And I think it, I think it's great too, that, that there's just more research and people are seeing that um, how they can help us like mentally too, not just. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No. We're, we're born to know plants mm -hmm, exactly. and hopefully appreciate their beauty. Mm -hmm, definitely. Lisa, yes. we, might, we might start um, a network mm -hmm. with the women's club right. about question and answers and uh, people who may want to keep their plants longer mm -hmm. or um, even folks who are familiar with certain plants to be consults or mm -hmm. mentors to other people mm -hmm. you know in the club to yeah. plants yeah and I talked I Dorothy Egger um I think she's a big gardener too and that's what we mm -hmm. talked about doing even just like a gardening interest group I just I don't have the wherewithal right now myself to start something like that but it could just be out of letter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Start with Christmas plants. <laughs> See, there you go. Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. Very good. So. I'd love to know how to do um, some container stuff because I, I tend not to have maybe the, <clears throat> the environment, although it, if I can grow in my bathroom <laughs> things that are, are uh, like, like uh, well, I must tell you, in, in my bathroom, I have a large tiled area. Mm -hmm. above a garden tub and, yeah. and a huge window there. So it's a perfect place to grow plants. I don't, um, but the moisture also helps in it. Definitely, definitely. So anyway, that that's, <laughs> but I've seen people put, you know, orchids on uh, above their toilet in a little thing and, and it grows beautifully. Mm -hmm. Ferns as well. Yes, yes, no, definitely. I, I know it is, it's a great, great place to be able to go ahead and and grow them with before you. you before you go what was that second um saying you said um there's not, not mr burbanks but oh, oh yeah so i'm going into the garden to lose my mind and to find lose your mind and, and and save your soul is that save, what you said? Find, my, find my soul yeah. I'm, okay. <laughs> I, it's, it's actually mind. a take on john muir's quote which uh -huh. is i think into the woods i go to lose uh -huh. my mind and find my soul. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah, that's so my thank you. It's, this has been very educational because I do have problems with some, not with the amaryllis as much as with the poinsettia. They last forever. I, I never throw them out. And then I don't do anything to make them bloom. So I maybe should try some of that. 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think once it's just a matter of um, kind of a little bit of trial and error and yeah, mm -hmm. knowing a little bit about the, the dorm. I, I find indoor plants tricky other than the basics. <laughs> <laughs> like like mother-in-law's tongue. I think I can grow that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, you could probably grow more than you. Than oh, I know, but I, I, I just, it's taking time. Yeah, it does. Yep. Just like, just like every, yeah. And finding the right light for your, for your plant is also tricky. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, it, that it is. You do. I mean, there are some, you really just need, you know, lots of sun. And if you don't have that in a nice window. Right? They'll tell you. They do. Yes. <laughs> they will wilt nicely. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yep. All right. Well, I guess if there aren't any other questions, of course, my it was my mouse that decided to go ahead and I think stop. Um, there we go. Stop um, 